Belize. This small country in Central America is full of tropical islands, lush, beautiful jungle, impressive Mayan ruins, and some of the best and coolest people we've ever met. Here, you might be surprised to find nearly as much cultural diversity as biodiversity. Join us on our adventure to find out what this small slice of paradise has to offer. I didn't think it would shoot beside. Yeah, of course, it always shoots beside. I'm f I'm sorry. <laughs> uh... Belize only has two places you can cross into the country by land. One border crossing going to and from Guatemala in the west, and one border crossing in the north connecting it with Mexico. We were taking the north border crossing to enter the country. The border crossing into Belize is one of the best in Central America. Very simple and straightforward, with no photocopies of documents required or extra steps. We had actually driven through Belize about six months prior, but while organizing the next phase of the trip, decided we had some time and liked the country so much we would go back, trying to visit all the places we had missed previously. And things would also be a little different, as it was rainy season. Soon we were driving through the white, dusty roads of northern Belize. The last time we were here, we had covered the northern portion, visiting Cerros, a small coastal Mayan site, as well as Sartaneja. On this route, you come across one of three river ferries that are found in Belize, at least that we know of, acting essentially as a bridge. They run along a cable from one side of the river to another and are operated with a hand crank. The northern portion of Belize feels fairly remote. And it wasn't until we were reading about the Mayan history of Belize at another site that we realized just how few people live in this country. Despite being roughly the same size as El Salvador, which has around 6 million inhabitants, Belize only has around 400,000 people living in it. What's even more interesting is that during the peak of the Mayan civilization, the population living in what we now call Belize was estimated to be somewhere between 1 to 2 million people. We first saw these numbers after heading further south and visiting one of Belize's most famous and arguably most impressive Mayan sites, Lamanai. We camped a few minutes drive away from the spectacular site, and by pure luck, we're the only ones there in the morning. All the mine sites in Belize cost 10 Belize dollars, or roughly 5 US dollars per person for the day. That morning, walking into the site, we heard the sound of howler monkeys for the first time, also known as baboons in Belize. We couldn't see them, and honestly thought it was a hidden speaker in the trees. Up until then, we hadn't heard anything like it. With the site empty and all to ourselves, and the prehistoric sounds of the howler monkeys, this quickly became one of the highlights of our visit. We decided to keep heading south, and after passing through Belize City briefly, we found ourselves on the coast, just outside the town of Dangriga. There was a fairly nice beach we stopped at for a little bit and then continued on towards Hopkins. We had lunch at a little restaurant on the beach. I got a shrimp burger while Nikki went with a fish burger and we washed it down with Belize's own Belican beer. Belize isn't exactly known for its mainland beaches. 
Hopkins is nice, and we did go all the way down to Placencia just to see what it had to offer, but it was a little bit too developed and too expensive for us. Belize sits on the Mesoamerican Reef, which is the second biggest barrier reef in the world, so most of the tourism is on the various islands found scattered along the coast, with Key Cocker being the most popular. But again, too expensive. That led us to this website for Glover's Atoll. At first glance, it's a bit outdated, but we did manage to find an iOverlander review. Even more alarming, when we called to book, they immediately asked us to give up our credit card info. So we did. Soon we were leaving out of the Sati River, heading towards the tiny nine acre island that would be our home for the next week. We were told to be ready in the morning at the marina, just outside of Hopkins. And since we were camping, it was on us to bring our own food and water for the week. We met some really great people along the way, including Omar and Carmel, who generously let us use their camping hammocks that they had brought as backup, which was great because our tent and sleeping pads were not so comfortable. We also met Alan, who would be working as the island's cook yeah. for those on the meal plan, but he'll come into the story a little later. After about a 40 minute boat ride, we were at the island. We got a little tour along with some information about the marine life in the area, and then we were free to go pick a campsite and set up. An atoll is essentially a coral ring that formed around a former oceanic island. This process can take tens of millions of years, and from the air, you can see what used to make up the now eroded island. This makes for some incredible snorkeling and spearfishing. The island itself is in a marine protected area, meaning you have to either swim, kayak, or walk a mile north along the exposed coral edge before you can start fishing. On top of that, in these waters you can expect to encounter a number of different sharks. So we made a float out of old bottles we found in a milk crate to try and keep the dead fish out of the water and the sharks away. We didn't bother recording too much, instead enjoying the peace of the island life. We did bring a little 35mm film camera though. The island doesn't have any running water and has simple compost toilets. For cooking, there's a little communal kitchen for the campers, while the huts get their own. What this island does have, though, is a large amount of coconut trees. The coconuts are all you can eat, and the rule generally is, if you can hear water inside, it's good. Once you get your coconut out, you can crack it open with a rock. This one didn't end up cracking too well, and I lost most of the water. And finally, you can use one of these coconut grinders to shred the delicious coconut meat. We spent the week making and trying a variety of different coconut dishes, including making coconut milk, which we learned the hard way does not mix well with rum. And don't worry about cleaning up the shavings, because in the evening, an army of hermit crabs come out to clean up any leftovers on the ground. We spent most of that week in the water, snorkeling and spearfishing. The only downside was that lobster season was closed while we were there. Before we knew it, it was time to head back. But this time, on our second visit, we didn't get to go out to the reef. Instead, we went to Coxcomb Basin, a part of Belize we had missed on our first part of the trip. Coxcomb Basin Wildlife Sanctuary is home to the world's only jaguar reserve, and as a result, has the highest concentration of jaguars per square mile in the world. However, spotting a jaguar is no easy task. It's not really something that just happens by accident. And since we were on somewhat of a time limit, 
we decided to focus on enjoying some of the park's activities. Coxcomb really is a dense, humid combination of jungle and rainforest. We decided to cool off by tubing down the river, which is a great way to see a lot of the jungle with little effort. After about 20 minutes, you reach a little swimming platform and walk back to the start. We decided we would come back in the morning to do a small hike to a lookout, and on the way out, stop to check out an old plane crash site. We decided to drive out of the park for the night as the camping fees were a little high for us. We found a spot not too far from the entrance and set up for the night. There was this cool highway of leafcutter ants, and we've seen these guys all over Central America. These ants are actually really interesting, and they act as farmers. Instead of eating the leaves, they bring them to their underground nests and use the leaves to feed a fungus, which then they eat in turn. The next morning, we headed back into the park to do a little hike up to a waterfall and a viewpoint overlooking the basin. It was a beautiful and quiet hike. The night before, it had rained a little, and with the summer sun above, the humidity was beginning to be stifling. The decision to keep going when we got to the waterfall was tough. It wasn't far to get to the top of Men's Bluff, but it was steep. We decided to press on and enjoy the waterfall when we got back down. Soon we started to see over the top of the thick canopy below. And with another little push, we were finally at the top. <laughs> we were looking across at Victoria Peak, which is Belize's second highest point. Belize is actually a pretty flat country overall, with the highest point at around 3,600 feet, or just over 1,100 meters. After taking in the views, we were eager to get back down and into the water. Finally, the water was in sight. The water was surprisingly cold and refreshing. We couldn't help but think about the researchers who used to walk up to the viewpoint with heavy radios before this area had any development, and how amazing it was to have found this pool in the middle of the jungle. After walking back, we stopped at the information center before leaving. It's kind of crazy to think less than 50 years ago, jaguars were being hunted for their skins in this same area. We were finally heading west towards San Ignacio, where our plan was to intercept a package we had ordered before even entering Belize. Along the way, we thought we'd visit an old camp spot from the first time we came to Belize along the Shibun River. 
The last time we were here in the dry season, we spent two days on the bank of the river, swimming in the crystal clear waters. But this time, it would not be the same. As we got closer to the river, the water on the track got deeper and deeper. Eventually, there was no point in going further, and we turned around. When you're alone, without a recovery vehicle, you have to know when to call it. We drove further and found a spot on the Belize River instead. The really nice thing about Belize is there is a real focus on wildlife and nature conservation. In turn, this means the many rivers that are easily accessible have almost no litter at all. When driving around, you frequently see signs advertising the conservation of various animals in the country, and we also found, in our experience, most Belizeans are very aware of the wildlife found in Belize. Because of this, overlanding and camping is extremely accessible all over the country due to the numerous backcountry roads and parks. The next morning after packing up, we headed into Balmapan, which is the capital city of Belize, despite only having a population of 16,000 people. Here we stopped at a west track to do a quick parking lot break job. We had a bunch of people stop by asking questions and chatting about the trip and the truck. It was also about a million degrees out so Nikki set up this little shelter with a fan that helped a lot. And about an hour later we were back on the road. We made a few stops to resupply before heading out. First we got some gas, which down here is butane, not propane. It's technically a mix of the two, but either way, through our little stove, it all seems to burn the same. Yeah. And it's small and funny is a bit big. Have a nice day, sir. We also stocked up on some groceries. Finally, we were heading into Pine Ridge Mountain Forest Reserve. We decided to go to Thousand Foot Falls first, which is thought to be the highest waterfall in Central America. There's a bunch of signs that say 4x4 only, and maybe in the end of the rainy season it gets bad, but we never switched out of two-wheel drive for this track. Some clearance is definitely helpful though.
eventually we made it to our destination. As you can see by the sign, Thousand Foot Falls is actually 1,600 feet tall. You can't get anywhere close to the waterfall, at least not from this point, but it's still a great view and good place to stop for lunch. Next, we drove over to one of the most popular spots in Pine Ridge, Rio on the Pools. It was a little busy and getting late, so after we had a nice swim, we left to make camp. You can only camp in two designated campgrounds in the forest reserve, so we just left and camped outside. But before we did, we filled one of our water jerrys with water from the river. We just use our pop-up wash tub for the river water and then filter it with a water purification pump made by MSR. At this point, we had been pretty lucky, as we hadn't seen any evidence of the rainy season. But things were about to change. Luckily, this time it was just a quick shower. But this would set off a trend of intermittent on and off rain for the next week. We went back to Rio on the Pools for a quick morning swim, this time having the river all to ourselves, before heading over to see the Rio Frio Cave. Our last stop in Pine Ridge was Big Rock Falls, another popular swimming spot. Pine Ridge also has the Caracal Ruins, but we were on a mission to intercept the elusive package which we had ordered to San Ignacio. So we made our way to the old house hostel, and just in time, because the rain came with us. This is a great place to stay if you're in San Ignacio. But the next day when the weather had passed, we got an update that our package was delayed a second time for two more days. Since the truck is a camper, we decided to save a few dollars again and left the hostel to go to a paid campground in town, Manakai. This place offers cabanas as well as camping with a communal kitchen in a pretty natural setting despite being essentially on the edge of downtown. Unfortunately, as much as we enjoyed our stay here, the package delays as well as the rain kept coming and we were having trouble finding ways to fill the time. Luckily, across the street was the market. Here you get a good idea of the cultural mix in Belize. About half the population in Belize is mestizo, literally meaning mixed from the colonizing Europeans mixing with the local indigenous people. Then about a quarter of the population is Creole and the rest is a mix between Maya, Garifune, East Indian, Mennonites, white people, and Asian people. As a result, in the market, you find a mix of cuisine from the different cultures, including cheeses made by the Mennonites, Caribbean food, as well as Mexican and Latino dishes. Between waiting out the rain and visiting the market, we also made our way just outside San Ignacio a few minutes to see Xunantanich, a mine site which to get to requires you to take another hand crank river ferry. After visiting the museum, we made our way up the hill to the main pyramid an archaeological site. 
The modern name, Kshunantanich, comes from Yucatec Maya, meaning stone woman, and refers to a ghost that, according to Belizeans, lives in the archaeological zone, appearing in front of El Castillo. We made our way to the top of the 130-foot pyramid, passing by entrances filled with bats along the way. At the top, you get a 360-degree view of the surrounding area, as well as an overlook at the entire archaeological site. We spent the morning walking around and visiting the various buildings around the site, and then headed back to our camp. At this point, after a bunch of phone calls, Amazon said our package was lost, so after a week of waiting, it was time to head back towards Belize City. In the beginning, our plan was to either revisit the reef or spend the week trying to spot a jaguar, but with the time lost, that wouldn't be possible. So we detoured a little south to a river spot we saw marked on I Overlander along North Stan Creek. This turned out to be a great spot with cool, crystal clear water, and again, we had it all to ourselves. The next morning, after making a coffee, we got pushed out of our spot by more rain. We also got a message that now our package was in Belize, but stuck in customs. This started a long, multi-day process that had us moving between the airport and Belize City over and over. There was only one upside to this whole situation, and that was that the Belkin Brewery was across the street from the Customs Depot. After all the headache, we decided to treat ourselves. We needed to do one more thing before getting our package released, and headed back to the city. That night, we went to Old Belize, a marina that allows camping for about seven US dollars per night. Remember Alan? Well, we stayed in contact over the six or seven months since the first time we met him, and we were committed to seeing him again before we left the country. He sent us a rough location with a screenshot of his live position on Google Maps and told us to come find him. After asking the neighbors for some directions, we had finally found the right place. We spent the night kicking back and relaxing. Alan is Garifune and taught us about the Garifune people. He also showed us his turtle shells, a traditional Garifune instrument. That evening, we met some of Alan's family, including his kids and grandkids, as well as his wife Gloria and her nephew Dre. Gloria braided our hair, and just like that, we were part of the family. You are Caribbean Nicky now. Yeah. Feels great. Later in the night, we met some more of the family and hung out, making our plans for the next day. I do that all the time. The next morning, we were up bright and early with the sun. I hope you will make it. This is what I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 don't be afraid. Don't. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, coffee. Yeah, Belize and coffee. That's, that's what we do in Belize. Oh, yeah. After getting all the gear out of the back seat of the truck, we loaded up with Alan, Gloria, and Dre and made our way for their farm. Once we were there, we got a tour of the area and got to try some different fruits. We got beef. Mm. That's right, he ate it all. Yeah. 
ich ja wohl machen will. No, take a snap of them. Have you saw, seen that before? What's this called? Crabble. Crabble? Yeah. Nikki, try this one. <laughs> that was the, wor the most sour one yet. <laughs> that one is more sour. Oh, jeez. The bugs here were ruthless, so that eventually cut our farm tour short, and instead we made our way to the river. Bamboo shoots are crazy. Yeah. Like crazy. Yeah, I've never seen bamboo like this. Like I've seen it growing, but not like this. This is crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We left Dre in charge of setting up the fishing pole and the fire while we walked part of the river. When we got back, the fish was almost ready, cooked with a side of green banana. What kind of fish is this? That's the black snapper. Black snapper. No, it's a red snapper. Nikki and I had never tried cooked green banana before, and to our surprise, it had the consistency and almost even taste of a baked potato. After we ate, we decided to move the truck further up the river in case of rain, as in this area, rivers can swell pretty fast. Everyone was fed, we got the snorkels out and enjoyed the river. While we were swimming, Dre managed to catch a little snack on the rod. And after a great morning on the water, we made our way back towards Alan's neighborhood, making some stops along the way. Both nights we stayed with Alan, we just parked the truck in his yard and camped there. Alan brought us out to the basketball courts in the evening. I never really played basketball and I'm pretty bad, but this time when I got on the court, I was worse than ever. <laughs> you get in there, you get in there. Our last stop of the night was to go do a bit of fishing. The truck only has three seats in it with a wooden platform replacing the fourth, but that didn't stop us from fitting five people in the back for a total of seven in the truck. Dre got in the water with the net to catch some bait fish, and after a while, the line was set. We never ended up catching anything, but it was a good night, and we called it early because we were exhausted from the day in the sun and water. That morning, after getting our braids cleaned up, it was time to say goodbye. Just like that, our Belize trip was over. 
you're, you're, you're in the system. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want people to recognize you here, man. <laughs> <laughs> really, man. This man looks like a real soldier. <laughs> no, a real soldier. Alright, boy, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As always, huge thanks to those of you who watched to the end, and I'm happy to say we were in a rush because we had an appointment in Mexico to get the truck on a boat. So if you're watching this video near the release date, the truck is currently on its way to Colombia. This is super exciting, but also scary because I've essentially run out of savings and YouTube combined with remote work is what's going to make or break this trip. So if you have a moment, uh, please like the video if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing and we'll see you guys next time in South America.